Have you ever noticed that the majority of individuals who develop diabetes are overweight? The key word there is majority, because there are also people who aren't at all overweight, yet they also develop type 2 diabetes. So, why? Supposedly, it comes down to a concept called the personal fat threshold, which actually has less to do with the typical body fat sitting beneath our skin and more to do with our liver. So to look at this, I read a scientific review making the argument for the personal fat threshold and exactly why it occurs. I'm gonna go into the physiology, dip your toe, your big toe, into the subcellular mechanisms and a few additional considerations that might be missed. Like, is it possible to set all diabetes into remission or only some? The personal fat threshold looks like this. But instead of me turning this into a dry lecture, let's animate this a bit. The first issue stated by the scientific review is the overconsumption of food, if that's hyper palatable, ultra processed, carbohydrates, fats, or broccoli, because we all know how fattening broccoli is, am I right? Either way, overconsumption leads to one initial issue. And while we generally start looking at how flabby our midsection gets. It's actually our liver that begins to suffer most and sets us down the path of diabetes. So yes, people gain body fat in their midsection from overeating, but if the liver is particularly affected, this dictates if a person is prone to much earlier onset diabetes at a much lower body weight. Okay, so what exactly happens to the liver? Liver fat increases, meaning the molecules of fat known as triglycerides accumulate in the hepatocytes, those are liver cells. This then leads to two effects. One, more triglycerides are exported from the liver in carrier packages called lipoproteins, specifically very low density lipoproteins or VLDL for short. These VLDLs and other lipoproteins carrying triglycerides drop off triglycerides to a variety of tissues. But the chief one of concern is the pancreas, where insulin is produced and released to control blood sugar levels. If the pancreatic islet, which is the section of the pancreas responsible for releasing insulin in this case, is overwhelmed with excess triglycerides, it is less able to release insulin in response to food consumption, especially carbohydrates. We'll get into the nebulous term of what overwhelmed means in a bit, because I always get annoyed when I hear explanations that are half-baked. It's not like the pancreas is on a call holding a baby while a, a toddler is in the back screaming about a broken toy and the pasta sauce is burning in the kitchen pan. So <laughs> what exactly does overwhelmed mean? Anyway, we'll, we'll get into it. Since the pancreas is overwhelmed and releases less insulin, blood sugar rises since insulin is needed to bind cells to remove blood sugar out of circulation. Okay, that's one effect by why blood sugar increases initially. And I mentioned there's a second effect, and that occurs at the liver again. Remember the overconsumption leads to a heavily partitioned amount of triglycerides in the liver? As a matter of fact, let me show you some images. As you can see, uh, these are MRIs of livers. The one on the left is from a type 2 diabetic, and the one on the right is not. I don't think I need to explain much more. You can see the sheer amount of coloration difference. The more color, the more fat. Never mind that different colors are different fat levels. To be clear, this isn't proof that this theory is correct. It just shows that the liver does get inundated with fat in this example of diabetes. Okay, so what's the second effect? Our liver becomes insensitive to insulin. So even if insulin is present when insulin binds the hepatocytes, again, those are liver cells, the cell signaling within these cells is inhibited from working. We'll get into exactly why in a minute, but why does that contribute to more blood sugar? Well, your liver is responsible for a process called gluconeogenesis, or the formation of new sugar, glucose, from things other than glucose. This metabolism is inhibited by insulin. So, put two and two together, we have insulin insensitivity, so the inhibition of gluconeogenesis is reduced, and thereby we experience an additional source of glucose into our bloodstream. 
over time, as our blood sugar levels remain elevated, the pancreas's baseline insulin secretion continues to creep upward, thereby leading to higher than normal insulin levels, blood sugar, and just general insulin resistance, which is another term of insulin insensitivity that we discussed. Okay, so pretty interesting stuff, but there are several outstanding questions. One, we need to address my pet peeve of overwhelmed by looking at mechanisms within the cell. And two, it was long believed that when a person has diabetes, their pancreas was under such stress, AKA overwhelmed, that many of the islet cells, remember that's the section of the pancreas that releases insulin, die. If they're dead, we can't secrete insulin. So does that mean that we're doomed once we develop diabetes? All right, let's get into this a bit deeper. We now understand that some people, even if they don't get over fat, their liver is. They've partitioned more fat molecules into their liver than under their skin, which leads to the all the, you know, the previously described effects. So I will quick note that some people also experience the opposite. Their liver remains relatively fat free, yet their subcutaneous under the skin fat increases rapidly. This could mean that some people, even if they're severely overweight, do not develop diabetes as easily because their personal fat threshold is higher. Needless to say, it still isn't beneficial in other aspects of health, but on this front, they may have some form of innate advantage, like a genetic one. So what exactly about the triglycerides, the, the fat molecules, leads to these negative outcomes in the liver and pancreas? They accumulate triglycerides, sure, but according to this scientific review, it isn't necessarily the triglycerides themselves, but rather what they can be converted to. These other molecules within the cells called diacylglycerols, as well as other intermediate molecules and ceramides. These fatty molecules then activate a protein called PKC. PKC then leads to the phosphorylation or tagging of the insulin signaling proteins, thereby inhibiting them. So if PKC inactivates the intracellular proteins like IRS and AKT, responsible for translating insulin binding to the exterior of the cell, then even if insulin binds, the signal will not be translated into the cell and the blood sugar will not be allowed through. This is the exact mechanism by which Overfatness of the tissues reduces insulin sensitivity, as well as impedes the pancreas from releasing insulin with a slightly different cell signaling twist, I presume. Okay, so we understand what overwhelm means, but is it true that people with diabetes are then screwed? Long-term remission is impossible because the pancreas has been damaged? Well, there's some truth to it, but there's also some hope. One of the mechanisms by which it's thought that the pancreas cells get damaged is due to the activation of the intracellular protein, PKC. Remember, that's the same protein that inactivates the insulin cascade, but it also has an effect on activating caspases. Since I assume that you aren't in a graduate molecular biology course, I'll just briefly mention that caspases are proteins within the cell that primarily cut up or destroy functional proteins within the cell. Why would they do that? Well, when the cell is on the verge of cell death, it will essentially do itself in by causing irreparable damage to itself. One of the mechanisms is through caspases. So, it stands to reason that greater PKC activity through increased diacylglycerols leads to further harm of the pancreatic cells. There's much more on this topic beyond mechanisms, but we can't spare the time at this moment. I'll cover more on pancreatic cell death in the future. But for now, know that one of the prevailing theories was that diabetes would lead to continuing damage to the pancreatic beta cells, and it was therefore believed that it could not be reversed. But the researcher of this review disagrees. According to the scientific review, it is believed that the pancreatic cells actually de-differentiate, which means that the cells revert back to a more stem cell-like phenotype. Essentially, they turn themselves away from being a pancreatic beta cell that secretes insulin and turn into another cell almost as if they're playing a game of hide and seek. Where's my beta cell? There you are. Oh, sorry, sir. 
I thought you were someone else, but in reality, it's a beta cell with a mustache on. Okay, so that lends some hope to the idea that diabetes can be reversed, doesn't it? If the cells aren't dead, but only playing hide and seek, shouldn't we be able to rediscover them? Well, a new study was published looking into this very effect in people with diabetes. And there are some fascinating results, but there's a catch. Now, I'll cover the details of the results, the catch, and more in the next episode, which you can find right here. I'll speak with you there. Thank you.